you figure with your fork, which I think is a great title because most disease in this country was created with a knife and fork, and Lenny's going to show you how you can uncreate it with the same tools, the knife and fork. Award-winning, Lenny Mulewath specializes in helping people who struggle with health, weight, and energy levels transform their bodies and their lives without going hungry or grueling excessive exercise. Lanny is the author of Fit Quickies, five minute targeted body shaping workouts. And creator of Lanny Milrath's plant-based blueprint. Lanny is presenter and celebrity coach for the 21 day PCRN vegan kickstart and veg run programs and is the fitness advisor for the Dr. John McGoogle Health and Medical Center discussion boards. She's also a dear friend, a great speaker, and I say pretty hot for an old broad 61. <laughs> Please welcome Lanny Miura. Hey everyone, thanks so much for coming today. And um, you know, I need to abandon this microphone because I tend to use my arms a lot and try not to hit people in the front rows. But I really want to thank you for coming to this session today. I recognize a lot of faces from yesterday who was in the Fit Cookies uh, Five Minute Fitness Solution. Excellent. And I got to tell you what, I saw evidence of your participation yesterday throughout the rest of yesterday. And even this morning, I saw people doing Fit Cookie number 10, legs into play. And I'll teach that again today in a little different position. I saw evidence of the seven seconds of flat belly and shoulders back. I also saw some people doing the other side of higher assets, which for those of you who weren't <laughs> yesterday, that's fit cookie number nine because it gives you higher assets. There's a T, assets, okay, put it wrong. And um, also, I saw some people standing at the sides and backs of rooms because you took the advice to heart about the hazards of sitting too much, so congratulations, job well done. Uh, today's focus is on the food. So that's what we're talking about. Show me the plants, how to be full without being fat, the three rules of satiety I'm going to teach to you, and you carve your figure with your fork. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you got to do the exercise too. But um, before we go any further, what I really want to impress upon you is that it's very important to understand that when you want to have success, in order to have success with your health and your weight, I have to use my hands. In order to have success with your health and your weight, you have to get three things into alignment. And unless you get those three things in alignment, your success will be lopsided, uh, it will be crippled somehow, and short lived. And when you get these three things in alignment, your success will be absolutely. Brilliant. So you want to hear what those three things are? <laughs> Let's see if I get this on here. Okay. These I call the three pillars of healthy success. And they are the movement, the eating, and the mindset. And when you get these three in alignment, that is when the change happens. You've seen my picture. This is my, you know, 50 pounds ago and, um, you know, about 15 years ago. And I'll tell you what, as someone who struggled with my weight for 30 years, that's many decades, and maybe some of you have had that experience or know someone who has had that experience. To find this solution of a whole foods plant-based diet as a way to easily maintain um, weight loss, to be able to eat to my heart's content every day without worrying about having my weight go up in pounds, this is like a major miracle. It's a dream come true for me. All I ever wanted was to be full without being fat. Does that sound like too much to ask? <laughs> you know, it just seems it make a lot. I, I was on a quest for that to happen. And what I was able to do was then learn to put this program together so that I was able to achieve that. Now think about it. If you can get control over your food, you can get control over more than you ever thought possible. And if you can get control or get some degree of mastery over your habits of thinking, then you can get control over your diet. And if you add exercise or physical activity to the equation, you give the whole thing muscle. Because physical activity, it boosts mental power. It restores your physical confidence. 
and it just brings the whole package together in a way that de delivers success. We know that people who exercise regularly have more of a sense of control over what's on their plate. So it takes those three pillars. And to, yesterday we focused a lot on the fitness pillar. Today we're gonna focus a lot on the food pillar, but you're gonna notice it's impossible for me not to weave them together because they are interdependent to my success. As a matter of fact, anecdotally, uh, oh, I call them the three Fs. This is an easy way to remember them. The food, the fitness, and the frame of mind. Address all three of those. And I bet if you have, if you are struggling, I bet you can find one of these that could, one of these three legs of your tripod that may be a little bit deficient. To anecdotally, when I was approached by Penguin Publishing to do a book on my five-minute workouts, um, of course I wasn't going to say no, but I said we also need to address the food, particularly and specifically a whole foods plant-based diet. And we need to address the mindset mastery or habits of thinking because that is the only way to really honestly deliver what I experienced for my success and with the people that I've coached and that I've trained for many years now. It takes addressing all three of those. So they were great with it. They said, this sounds fine, this sounds great. So we had a great relationship um, from there on in. But keep that in mind as we go through, it takes all three. So here's the plan for today. What I'd like to do, I think the best way to frame this lesson is to tell you a little bit about my journey, which I've already hinted at just a little bit. And- Do you think you could use a mic? Sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Okay. I need something to do my something to do my hand gestures then. Okay. <laughs> so I'm a little volunteer for that. Uh, I'll start with my journey because. I think that's the best way, you know, when you hear someone's story, and I was, just, I was talking to several people out here in the hallway earlier, and I admitted that one of my pet peeves is hearing about weight loss from someone who's never had a weight problem. <laughs> now, the people who, the doctors, we need them. They give us wonderful advice, and look what we've heard to this weekend. The dietitians give us wonderful designs, advice, but connecting those with the personal experience that's where I come in, because I hold these all three together, connect with you. So, um, I wanted to say one other thing before we go further, refer, any further. And this looks like a fitness book, right? I call it a Trojan horse book, <laughs> because it addresses the three pillars. And I just told you the story of my work with the publisher to put the, the uh, mindset mastery and the food in here too. And by the way, this has just been adopted as required text for a college course in Northern California, Kinesiology 31, because of the research and the work done in the exercise section. But guess what? This means that 30 to 60 students every semester are also going to learn more about a vegan whole foods plant based diet and the power that it has to, you know, accelerate the whole thing. So I'm very excited about that. That's good for all of us. Okay, let's, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit my, about my journey and also here's the lesson plan. Here's your takeaways for immediate action. Yesterday I gave you immediate action with exercise, right? I'm going to teach you the three rules of satiety as I put them together in a way that made a lot of sense to me, something that you can apply very simply. Um, I'll give you a quick, quick 10 minute move guaranteed to restore mental clarity. Those of you who were with me yesterday did the um, legs into play. Today we're going to do it in a slightly different position. I'll take you through that. I'll also teach you a willpower workout. I taught one yesterday, I'll teach you a different one today. I have a whole chapter in the Fit Quickies book called The Will. Uh, Wind Up Your Willpower, which has a couple of willpower workouts in it. So, and I'll tell you more about that as we go on. And then bonus plant-based tips, and then time for Q&A. Sound good? Okay, there's a plan. Okay, people look at me today, and they think that I never had a weight problem, but I did. I'm the one on the left. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help that everyone else in the picture is skinny. <laughs> But I am one of those people, I'm on the right in this picture. <laughs> now that's my tall, my three, sister, three years older than I. She looks like she's a skinny girl, doesn't she? She's actually very heavy now. She's probably about uh, 30, 40 pounds overweight compared to 
Anyway, that's me. <laughs> I was one of those people genetically predisposition to have a weight problem. Can anyone relate to that? You know, you know who you are. If you're a skinny person, or maybe you have a friend who has that problem. If you're a skinny person and has never have never struggled with your weight, you may not quite understand that. But for those of us who have tried everything, we understand. We have a sisterhood and a brotherhood regarding it. But I want to encourage you that predisposition does not mean destiny. There are some simple things that you can do that will make a difference for how your genetic expression, and it is a genetic predisposition, um, to mitigate the expression of that. One of those is, as I talked about yesterday, by exercising your body, you impact your genetic expression in several ways. One of those is with LPL. I also spoke to this yesterday. LPL is lipoprotein lipase. Now stay with me here, I know it sounds sciencey, but it has a big impact on how you store and manufacture or can lose weight. It is an enzyme that hangs out along your blood capillaries and its task is to pull any fat in your bloodstream and to put it in one of two places, either into your fat cells for storage or into your muscle cells to be used for energy. Now, I don't know where you want yours to go, but I want mine to go into the muscle cells for energy. Well, you can impact that genetic expression by exercising your body. It reduces its expression in the fat cells and it increases it in the muscle cells. Guess what the other way to do that is? Whole foods, low fat, plant-based diet. It actually switches off the fat chain. Right? So you're doing two things there. It's not just the calories. It's how your body responds to these different influences in your environment, in your food, and your exercise, or your environment. All right, there's my uh, a little bit again about LPL that I just explained. So you can amp, amp down your fat genes by eating a whole foods, low plant, plant fat based, plant based. Yeah, eat a fat-based diet, <laughs> and you'll be extremely successful, uh, and also physical activity. And I have all of this, notice I'm putting down the pages in the book. I have all of this in that book for you. It's a manual for successful weight loss using tips such as this. Okay, so we're going to back up. This is also me. This is me about four years old, and I could not put this picture in. Isn't this a riot? There's a room full of vegetarians or people aspiring to vegetarianism. Here I am next to a big chunk of meat on this bed, looking very disgruntled. But the, the, really, the reason I put this in is because I do want to express appreciation to my parents for establishing in me early on an appreciation for healthy diet and exercise. My parents had a bigger organic garden. My mother would not be caught dead with a donut or you know, anything like that in the house. Um, they both exercised. My dad went to the Jack Lane gym. My mom worked out with Jack Lane on TV. So they really did establish some um, good habits in me early on. So this is flashing forward in time. Um, you can see I still have a little struggle with weight here. But I became a vegetarian 40 years ago. That's 4-0. And I was sure that was the answer. I thought the pounds would melt off and that it would just, uh, that problem would go away. But as you can see, it didn't quite. But again, more credit to my parents. They searched high and low to find a bakery that would make a cake without eggs. And believe me, 40 years ago, that was not as easy as it is today. Um, speaking of cake, I always seem to be the person who is willing to cut the cake whatever the occasion was, because you never know when you might fall face first into a pile of frosting, right? <laughs> How did that happen? But I, I did not let my weight challenges get in the way of my fitness endeavors and my fitness career. Um, this was my first half marathon many years ago, but I was always very active, aspiring to kind of get a grip on this weight problem. But I didn't let it stop me. And I started teaching yoga when I was in college. That was the first thing I taught in fitness, and it's just progressed since there. And it's not like I didn't have some degrees of success along the way. This is from my CBS TV show that ran for about a year on CBS, Lanny's All Heart Aerobics. And I obviously am you know, fairly slim there. But this was not without a lot of effort. This was with a lot of management with either calorie control or portion control or some kind of micromanagement, you know what I'm talking about? 
that is so it's exhausting and it takes all of your attention. You're hungry all the time for some reason, you know, when you try to micromanage in the usual way. So I think that's a modicum of success, but it wasn't a lasting situation. See, I got tired of this kind of stuff. <laughs> this is a flashback to the zone. Remember the zone ballot? 2.xyz grams of this, and it's just, it addles the brain. So finally, about, uh, this was taken about 15 years ago, so picture that's in here. I gave up dieting. I just could not tolerate it anymore. And I decided I'll just be one of those healthy at any size people. They didn't make me happy, but I was so tired of the micromanagement and the up and down of the weight, I thought I'll, ju I'll just go there. By the way, when I did give up dieting, this is actually 15 pounds lower than my highest weight, which was 189.5. That 25 is very important. It wasn't quite up to 190. This, I think, was weighed about 175. But the reason I um, had started to lose weight, because even though I gave up dieting, which I gained a little weight at first, because I was, my hunger and fullness signals, signals were so messed up from trying to control hunger, put it off, you know, medicate it, um, hold, save up calories for the end of the day. Have you ever done that? Big mistake. But then I gradually, my diet got better because I wasn't going hungry anymore. And so my body started to naturally progress down my weight a little bit. But I still wasn't quite get, getting it all together. But I wanted you to understand, this is really a critical to the, the whole picture of my approach. Through all these years of struggle, I really believed that my hunger signals could not be faulty or wrong. What kind of a cruel joke would it be to be created with a body that drove you to eat until you were overweight? There must, you know, I live in the woods, my husband and I live in the woods in Northern California, and there's wildlife all over the place. The squirrels are running around the deck, the deers are out in the woods, we have a bear that feasts in the <laughs> compost bin, and they're not having weight problems, they're not counting grams of whatever. They're eating until, they're, there's plenty of food for everyone. Um, you know, what is it that they figured out that I'm not getting here? What can I learn from them? This, by the way, is Rocky, our rescue squirrel, who we found her in the woods um, almost two years ago, crawling through, just had fallen out of a nest, and we adopted her, and for two years, she would come in every day and sit on our laps and eat uh, peanuts and take massages and swing in the hammock with us, and yeah. And she never had a weight problem, no matter how, many, how much she pounded down the peanuts, okay? When she was done, she just knew she was done. So this leads us forward a little bit more in time. And I'm going to get you up on your feet in just a few minutes. I think we need to get our bodies in. But let me tell you a little bit more story first, all right? About five years ago on my, uh, no, about a couple of years ago, I put up this article on my blog called My McDougal Diet Failure. Now, since I'm the fitness advisor for the McDougal Health and Medical Center discussion boards, this got a lot of attention. Why does she have failure and McDougal in the same <laughs> sentence? How many of you have gotten a chance to hear Dr. McDougal talk during the course of, and he's speaking again this afternoon, if you haven't gotten a chance. And this was the story of my progression through attempting the McDougal diet and what changed my, my perspective on that finally and actually brought me a lot of success. I first heard about Dr. McDougall's work, and the first book came out in about 1983, the McDougall program, and I was probably one of the first people to buy it, and you know what? I loved the book because its message was compatible with, with my ideology. Eat until you're hungry, stop when you're not. All you have to do is not eat those things, <laughs> you know, eat those things. And it made a lot of sense to me. I tried it for like about three days, and then I got hungry and I abandoned it. Just didn't work. And then probably about 10 years later, I did the same thing. And then 10 years later, you know, I just kept trying it because I thought, this sounds really good to me. You're supposed to be able to eat according to hunger and fullness. There were a couple things that I wasn't quite getting right until I had the chance to go visit Dr. McDougal at a physician <coughs> seminar that was in my town in Northern California. I'd been invited by the CHIP program. I work with Hans Deal as fitness advisor for the local program. And Dr. McDougal was coming to town for a physician seminar. To go spend 
all day listening to Dr. McDougall talk to a room full of cardiologists. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay. So he was up there talking about how to prevent heart disease, reverse heart disease through diets, and of course all the cardiologists are you know, very skeptical because oh, they come from the medical background. How can we treat this with medical interventions? But I tell you, you know, if you have heard him speak, he's very disarming. Um, he doesn't make you feel threatened, and he also it makes so much sense. He showed all these slides of, you know, what happens in your bloodstream when you eat a high-fat diet, and and what's happening with um, all these measures of your health depending on what you eat, and specifically the problems with high-fat foods. So, but here's the thing: is I came away from that day with two specific big lessons that led to my three rules of satiety that we're just about to get into. Um, one of those is that as much as I thought I was over it, I still suffered from carbophobia. Do you know that's an actual term now? Look at this. Oh, I already had it. It is uh, in the Journal of American Nutrition. It is a form of nutrition misinformation infused into the American psyche through multiple advertising avenues that include magazine ads, television infomercials, and especially best-selling diet books. And I tell you this carbophobia, it is insidious. It keeps us from eating the, the healthiest carbohydrates, you know, the, the potatoes and the yams and the, all of the, you know, the whole grains. And I know it's insidious because I get people calling me all the time and they spend me a, pay me a lot of money to help them find out what's wrong with their eating. And here's how they usually start out. We have a breakfast. I had one ounce of, <laughs> as soon as I get that, I know it's the Weight Watchers carryover. That has nothing to do with meeting their hunger and fullness needs at a certain point of time during the day. So this is what I'm talking about, mindset shift. And I, I do not underestimate the challenges of making this kind of a mindset shift. It's a big one to make because if you have been dieting for a low 30 years, you don't just shift into something like that very easily. And that was one of my problems with eating according to some of the guidelines Dr. McDougall was bringing forth. You see, just because you know intellectually it's right, if you're afraid that being full means that you're going to gain weight, sounds crazy, but for those who've been there, you know exactly what I mean. And I also came away with an understanding of what really calorie concentrated foods, such as dairy foods and oils, which I was still eating at that time, can do to mess with that genetic predisposition and your hunger and fullness. And so what I came away with is what I developed into the three rules of satiety, which is a very simple way of putting together that helped me um, establish some guidelines for eating. So, Three rules of satiety, we're just about to go there, and I wanted to give you a differenti differentiation between these two terms, satiation and satiety. We tend to use them interchangeably, but they're actually two different things. Satiation is when you eat a meal and at the end you go, oh good, I've had enough. And satiety is the carryover effect. So maybe two, three hours later, you still feel like you, you're satisfied, okay? For our purposes, I just call the three rules of satiety because calling the three rules of satiation just you know, too, you know, it's too complex. So, but I wanted to, uh, to point that out. But both of these are important to your fullness signals. Okay. So here are the three, and I'll break down all three of them so you can go away with a very clear idea of how to apply them. One is on weight, one is stretch, and one is energy nutrition. These are all detailed in the nutrition chapter in my Trojan Horse book, Fit Quickies. Remember, it's not just an exercise book. It's uh, easy weight management with a whole foods plant-based diet. Okay, so let's start with weight. I don't know if you know this, but when I learned this, I was just stunned and fascinated. Every day, we eat, each one of us, about the same amount of food in weight as every other day. So that means if you take all the food that you ate yesterday and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then the day before you had taken all the food that you ate and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then tomorrow, take all, you see where I'm going with this? Every day it would weigh about the same. Did you know that? Very interesting. So I thought, okay, well if that's true, then what does that say about what you put in that basket? 
Now, there are a lot of reasons that we reach fullness when we eat. Many that we know a lot about, this being one of them. Many that we probably have not even discovered yet. But what I'm going to invite you to do is think, if that, just isolating that one reason for fullness, the weight of the food in your, in your body at the end of the day, which one of these foods would be more likely, by the time you hit that weight, to have you overshoot your calorie needs than the other. Cheese. All right, here I have a pound of cheese and a pound of apples. They take up the same amount of space, and I just told you they weigh the same, right? But if you just isolate it by weight, it's about two apples is like about a pound of cheese. I went into the market and weighed it. So if your body is just responding on weight alone, you understand that if you have a very calorie concentrated food and it hits that weight, see how that can get this a new trouble? This was just uh, mind blowing for me because I thought, oh, well that's why that works. Not just the calorie content, but why my body's responding itself like that. Okay, the next rule is stretch. We have stretch receptors in our gut. You probably know about this. As you start to eat a meal, your, your gut stretches. I don't say just stomach because it's the gut's whole, actually, this whole assembly of organs down there. And it starts to stretch and it triggers stretch receptors in your brain that tells your brain you've had enough to eat. That was just one of many signals, yes. But let's isolate that. Let's just look at the stretch. And let's take those same foods. Based on the stretch of your gut, Taking the same amount, you know, one pound of this food and one pound of that food, by the time it stretches your gut, which one of these is more likely to have you overshoot your calorie needs by the end of the day than the other? And by and I know everyone knows it's a cheese, but even more so because cheese is so, there's no fiber in it, so as soon as you chewed it and swallowed it, it becomes liquid, it doesn't take up a lot of space, whereas the apple has a lot of fiber. Now, I really like understanding this because it takes the good and bad out of food, it, takes, it brings the reason in, it brings the science in about why fiber will be helpful to you. So here's some calorie comparison of fresh fruit versus cheese, and I put chocolate in there too because it's pretty close. Um, apple and other fresh fruits weigh in at about 300 calories per pound, that's the apples, and then cheese and chocolate are about 2,000 calories per pound. Oh, wow, that's a big difference, it's like 10 times, almost 10 times as many. Okay, then the third rule of satiety is energy and nutrition. And I think this is the one where I messed up the most. Although the stretch receptor phenomenon is an obvious sign of fullness, the activation of intestinal nutrient receptors play a role in satiety as well. Guess what? Calories is one way of doing that. That's one way your body reads nutrition. If you are a person who is chronically cutting calories and then doing a stuff star, star kind of cycle, you know what it's like when you um, have a few days, I call it stored hunger, maybe two or three days go by or maybe even just a few hours and then you're really prone to overeat, that's because you haven't hit those nutrient receptors enough. And this relates to my problem with carbophobia because I wasn't eating enough of the whole grains and starchy vegetables and things that would really give me good, solid stretch and weight and calorie and nutrition. You see how that works? This is the, the, the long short here is that foods or edibles parading as food. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if, if you can squeeze a lot of calories into a tiny space, then this is going to be problematic for you in the light of the fact that this stretch and the weight and the nutrition make a big difference. And you know, I'm gonna emphasize on the nutrition again. If you don't have enough calories from early in the day, you're gonna get into trouble because you could hit the stretch and the weight with celery and cardboard, but you're not gonna be able to stay with that kind of way of eating, right? Okay, and I probably do too many years of celery and cardboard. I did not eat cardboard. <laughs> but I want you, I think I'm making a point here, so it makes sense to you. Okay, good. So 
Here's how to be fat before you're full. And you probably heard some other people talk about oil over the last couple of days, but if you realize, let's take this through the three rules, the, the, the stretch and the weight and nutrition, the three different points that we just talked about. Okay, olive oil or any kind of vegetable oil has 120 calories per tablespoon. It doesn't take up very much space for the stretch. It doesn't have very much weight for the weight. But when you look at whole food, even a high fat whole food, 120 calories is two thirds of a cup of oil. Now put this through the, the filter of the stretch and the weight and the nutrition. Another thing is high fat versus low fat. Uh, and a lot of people come to me and they'll go, oh, but I get so much more satisfied when I eat a high fat diet. It just stays with me through the, you know, I have big fatty breakfast and it stays with me through the course of the day. But guess what, the research doesn't support it even though you may initially feel like it's got you more satisfied, there is research has been done that shows that if you have a high fat breakfast, by the end of the day, the, the hunger is not satisfied as much as you have more carbohydrate for breakfast. Here's the study. They had um, breakfast was of a 400 calories, calorie breakfast, they added to one group a fat supplement that was 362 added fat calories, and the other group had 362 added carb calories. They had the same, you know, amount of calories. And these were able, these groups were able to eat ad libitum throughout the rest of the day. You know what ad libitum means? That means according to appetite. You're hungry, you eat. That's, you know, without any external controls. And the group that had the high fat supplement at breakfast ended up consuming more calories overall by the end of the day than those had it, who's had extra carbohydrates. So if you're thinking that fat is protecting you from overeating later on, it is not supported by the research. So this is one of my clients um, who, she's a very high power and high level nursing instructor who travels to South Africa several times a year to teach uh, the university students there, and her struggle was trying to figure out how to do the diet and exercise and the mindset on a busy schedule, which is my specialty. But we put it together, how to nudging out the oil, doing simple movements such as in fit quickies, and also incorporating more, more whole foods made a difference. So look at how our whole demeanor has changed. And there are more, um, more stories like this on my website, but just to give you an, an inspiration, this is her uh, numbers. You know, her blood lipid levels and her cholesterol and all of that and her weight. She's very scientific about graphing everything. So long short, if you don't understand why processed, fiber-free, and high-fat foods are the problem, you will be stuck continuously fighting a war with your weight and hunger that you'll never win. So real quick questions. Does someone have a quick question before we go on? I want to make sure that these three rules are easy and applicable and that you can figure out how to connect them with your own experience. Yes? I eat like a lot of steamed broccoli and carrots and some brown rice and I don't have half an avocado on there, I will be hungry a half hour later. Well, you have the half an avocado. That's a whole food that has some fats in it. We do need fats in our diet and you can get it from whole foods as you just did. Or I'll put olive oil on top of quinoa and kale and sweet potato. But mm -hmm. if I don't do that, maybe some walnuts on there. If I don't do that, I will be really hungry. Exactly. That's what, but you put nuts and avocado in there. The oil isn't going to help you because it's going to, but then but the point is by the end of the day, the entire level of carbohydrate, I mean, excuse me, calorie consumption is not mitigated by adding liquid fats that are take up a little bit of space. So the lesson for you to put together is maybe you need more frequent meals or maybe you need more whole food fats through, the, through those meals through the course of the day. Yes, was there another hand over here? Yeah. Um, I've gone decades without having oil and vinegar or salad dressings or fried food, you know, fat or yes. anything. And I've learned recently that I would be able to better digest all my organic garden veggies if I actually added oil. Um, I get more nutritional value out of it and I'm losing weight and I'm exercising less. So uh -huh. I'm, and I'm you know, I'm not weak. So I'm wondering, there's, I mean, beside nuts, I cannot afford nuts and avocados normally on my diet. <laughs> what are on my budget? What, what are good vegetarian fats that, um, and oils that I could have? 
my eye doctor says I need more oil, need more fat. Yeah, well, I'm speaking from a perspective of struggling with a weight problem and how the, the liquid fats contributed to that and how a high fat diet contributed to that. So that's a perspective I'm coming from. And I don't know what your doctor is advising you about oils with um, eyes. I don't, you know, I don't know quite what that's coming from. But when you find that there are fats, do you know that even um, garbanzo beans are 14% fat? And we think of them as being a non-fat food. So I mean, I don't know what your personal experience is. If you're working a nutritionist, um, I don't know if you're having a problem that you're struggling with. So, are you, you know, if there's a question you have about helping you with something, I'm trying to lose or weight and trying to be healthy, oh, and okay. try and hear different things about fats. And okay, oils. we need healthy fats. We need fats, but we need no more than 10 or 15 percent of calories from our diet from fats. And you get that if you eat a whole foods, plant-based diet. If you switch to isolated fats, the measure of fats goes up uh, dramatically. So I, I, you know, I can't advise you about what you should do about the oils other than what my experience has been and that I do not see them as a health food. I'll tell you what, you know, who, what's, what do you think of when you think of a junk, of junk food? What's the first thing that comes to mind, chips? Chips? You know what it is for me with sugar? And I think it's because when I was a kid, that was the first thing that came out was junk food. And why was it a junk food? Okay, it was separated from its fiber. It was uh, devoid of nutrition and it was strictly calories. Well, in a way, there is not a difference between that and oil. But oil just has to be more problematic because it's all fat. And if you're looking for the trace omegas and things that are in there, those can be obtained through whole foods. Broccoli has omega-3 oils, flaxseed, walnuts, all of those things have omega-3 oils. So, you know, a good recommendation for you to, if you're looking for how to eat vegan cheap, there's a book out called Eat Vegan on $4 a day. If you want some, you know, <coughs> ideas about low fat, uh, I mean, low cost fats, but there's no way that I can advocate oil in a diet. And if you've been to your Brenda Davis and Susan Levin, you'll hear that repeated over and over again. So, and that has been my experience with weight management. So that's what I bring to you today. Yes. Yeah, you know what? This was a big thing for me. I was really good at, um, you know, getting in my exercise during the, in the middle of the day and holding off on the calories, and then falling into the pan of brownie dough in the afternoon. <laughs> and or I do this. I go to at, at lunch. I go maybe I better cut back, have one piece of bread and cut it in half, you know, or have an open faced sandwich, and then you know, eating chocolate chip cookie dough all afternoon. And I think you know I should have just had another piece of bread at lunch. And this ties into, this is one of the answers. Uh, one of them is not eating enough is going to cause your desire for high fat, high sugar foods to be driven up. Because guess what? Biologically, you are programmed for survival, correct? And if you are sending your body the message that you're cutting back on calorie consumption and getting less, um, less of what you need for survival, you are going to be very keenly interested in high fat, high sugar foods because guess what? Those are the best things for storing and manufacturing body fat on your body. So if we eat too little, this is why we crave the high, the high calorie foods. That makes sense? But another thing about the salt and the sugar is if you are eating these foods regularly, they stimulate that taste. There is a biochemical cascade that happens with sugar and salt and high fat foods. There's a trigger of dopamine that because again, it's natural, it's not your fault. Your body biologically is designed to love those foods because yay, it's gonna make you survive. If you've had a weight problem, you're one of the survivors. You got a good one. <laughs> it just does, you know, I would say our biology hasn't caught up with our te technology because now we just don't have the need for the calories and they're so readily um, available. Okay, let's do, um, again, we're, we're biologically driven to satisfy our urge for food. So don't blame, you know, if you're hungry, it's, you gotta look to eating early in the day and that's one of my rules on the tips I'm gonna get to uh, later on. It's too tempting to save up calories, to fall into old diet, dietary habits and patterns of thinking, yes. Um, do you think that when you're eating a 
whole foods, plant-based diet that's necessary to count calories. For example, um, last year when I started like going on the health journey, when I first started, I was counting a lot of calories and I noticed that you talk about like getting in the mindset. I realized when I was counting calories, it was really messing me up more mentally where I was more finicky about things. And I was like, oh my God, this calories, this calories, that. And now I don't count calories and I noticed that that really helped me dramatically with losing weight and getting healthier and especially getting into the mindset of having a better self-esteem. I feel that when you eat whole foods and you're actually eating the right foods and having a balanced diet, you don't really need to count calories. Yeah, did you have a question? You just gave a little lesson. <laughs> When you are eating according to these guidelines, then that need to do that evaporates. But you make a really good point. It's hard to extract your mental self mentally. It's very scary. If you've been controlling and micromanaging your weight through counting things, it's hard to let it go. But you can do that if you are eating from a whole foods, low fat, plant based diet. And I'll show you what my, um, oh here, this will help you out. This is how I do it. Because that drove me crazy too, the calorie counting. I call it my big plate trick. You know the small plate trick? You just go fill it again. <laughs> you know, I even saw a column by a vet. Someone said, I need to help my, my dog needs to lose weight. And the vet said, I kid you not. Get a smaller bowl. <laughs> like the dog's going to go, oh yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Isn't that just hilarious? So this is kind of a, what it looks like. These are some pictures from my plant-based blueprint, which is available as a free download on my website. I actually, uh, I'll show you more about that in a minute. But here's how I look at my food, and it answers how I deal with that. What I do is I look back, if I look back at my plate at the end of the day, put it all on a big tray. Half of the tray would be filled with like starchy vegetables, whole grains, that's how I kind of break it up into food groups. And then the other half would be the high water content, more perishable vegetables, you know, the cruciferous vegetables and the, the greens and the carrots and all those things. There'd be a few pieces of fruit on top, maybe about a cup of beans and a couple ounces of nuts, and that would be what my food would look like. And I, that's, I love it being that simple. But that means I also have to take the responsibility of making sure I get all those vegetables in and don't just you know, eat bread and rice all day. Um, bread's great. I ate bread every day of my weight loss, by the way. So uh, that's how you do it. But um, you have to level the playing field. You cannot eat according to appetite like this if you're eating a standard American diet. If you have a predisposition to a weight problem, we all have skinny friends who just ate M and M's all day and it didn't matter on their weight. Right? <laughs> I tell you what, if you're still aspiring to that, give it up. One of the big changes, and it was a mindset shift for me, is I stopped being a spoiled brat about, I want to eat whatever I want, still lose weight, because so-and-so can do it. Well, that's not my body. So I, I was telling you about the plant-based blueprint. When I have uh, Fit Quickie's book came out, I put together a two-day sampler. And what this is, it's a very simple outline. I, I went through, I did a food journal. So you can look over my shoulder. What does it look like to eat like that every day? Kind of like, sounds like what you're doing, too. Um, and that's downloadable for free. And if you get the, if you buy the Fit Quickies book, I'll be signing these outside here. If you like to get a signed book, um, you can go download a, the full 60-page two-week document that is full of tips and tricks and some recipes. Some of those pictures, I, you know, this is a piece from it. And some notes I have to help you along since I struggled for this for, with this for so long. Um, my soup recipe, something in my kitchen, my world burger. So anyway, it's time for a fitness break. That's our clue. And then I'm going to get you back and we'll do some more of the, um, the, the tips, uh, the Q&A, plant-based tips. So I've got to get you on your feet. We're starting. It's too close after lunch. We're starting to slip into sleep. So, so please get up on your feet. Yesterday, you know about legs into play, where we got the the peripheral pump of the body, which is your we were here yesterday. Yesterday. for those who were here. Your calf muscle is your peripheral pump, 
And every time you contract your calf muscle, you push the blood back up into your heart to be reoxygenated and you feed your brain. Look at people are doing it already. <laughs> you also move your lymphatic system, which is your detoxing agent. Is it any wonder when we're sitting down for half an hour, 45 minutes, we start to nod off and get drowsy, okay? So I wanted you to get on your feet for the rest of the remainder of our When yesterday oh. you were um, with me, uh, by the way, just briefly, there are ways to restore your willpower. Exercise, three to five minutes of exercise restores willpower. I'll explain how. Um, meditation and reading exercises also do that. Here's what happens, and I spent more time on this yesterday, but we're getting close to the end of the hour, so I'll kind of jam through it. Willpower comes in limited supply. Isn't that disappointing? You know, but I, it, it actually, it should be reassuring to you. I want to tell you if the end of the day comes and you feel like you don't have any willpower or willpower, it's not your fault. It's because when you have your night's sleep and you got up in the morning and you're all motivated, you know, isn't that when you're all motivated? I'll do my exercise, I'll eat right, I'll do this, do that. Um, but it gets hammered away by stress. And that means all the little things of normal everyday life, let alone the big things. And it starts to hammer away at the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is your command center. And when it's gone, it's gone. There goes your willpower and your willpower. So no wonder 2 o'clock in the afternoon arrives and that tray of donuts in the office break room just looks really good and I'm not going to go over and do my work. I don't forget that. But you can restore it quite quickly by doing what you just did. That restores by doing deep breathing exercises and any kind of meditation. This is why people that I coach, I say you need to have some kind of a restorative practice in place and do it prophylactically. Don't wait until you're in the middle of stress at four o'clock in the afternoon and kick it in. You will learn to be able to kick it in at those points in time if in the morning before you get up, practice slow breathing. When you get into bed at night, practice slow breathing. The seven seconds to a flat belly exercise, which is fit quickie number one, which we learned yesterday in the five minute fitness class is a perfect match because not only does it flatten your belly, but it slows your breathing down to restore variable heart rate. Do you know about variable heart rate? Let me tell you really quick, because this is huge. Under normal conditions, we have what is called heart rate variability. That means your heart rate varies according to the stress. You know what it's like when you get stressed and your heart rate goes up, whether it's a physical stress or an emotional stress, and then when the stress is passed, your heart rate drops down. Have you ever had it when you feel like I'm just all heat up all the time? Don, I know you all have. <laughs> like your shoulders are up here, you've lost your neck. Because uh, they're up here like this. I call it kind of Friday neck. It's like, mm. <laughs> that means that your heart rate is, is staying elevated. But you can easily restore heart rate variability by doing this simple exercise where you, you slow your breathing down to four to six breaths per minute. Right? Let's go through a minute of six breaths in a minute to see how it feels. Ready? Inhale, two, you can close your eyes if that helps you, three, four, five, and exhale, two, try to slow to my rate, four, five, inhale, two, three, four, five, let your face relax, two, three, four, Five. Breath in again. Two, three, four, five, and exhale. Let your shoulders relax. Three, four, halfway there. Inhale. Two, three, four, five, and breath out. Two, three, four, five. Two more. Inhale. Two, three, four. Deep breath in and out. <clears throat> Two, three, four, five, one more time. Inhale, two, four, five, and breath out, two, three, four, five. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. You may have felt like it was hard to slow it down like that. It may have felt normal to you and that may give you information about what your heart rate variability is right now. But that simple exercise restores that even tone to your heart rate and if that becomes easy, you slow it to four breaths a minute, which is 15 seconds for each round of breathing. That's like seven seconds in, seven seconds out. Sound familiar? Uh -huh. That's a match for seven seconds to a flat belly. Doing that exercise is going to help you prevent stress. 
This is called stress protection rather than just stress management. Yes. Um, I find myself you know, I don't think they've ever figured out what yeah. Yvonne is. I think it's still a big mystery, but that's a good theory. Yeah. Okay. So I hear I have meditation and exercise. Okay, bonus plant-based tips. <laughs> Isn't that great? Right. Okay, first is keep it simple. People switch to a whole foods plant-based diet and they try to micromanagement, micromanagement just like they did a diet. And that's why I appreciate that you brought up the calorie counting because it's very hard to let those habits go. Um, eat to satisfaction from your first meal in the day. I've talked about that a little earlier. I was very guilty of storing up calories. And calories. I'd be so proud of myself. I got to lunch and I'd only eaten 500 calories. Gee, that means I probably have maybe another thousand. Well, guess what? It was so easy to plow beyond an additional belt. You know what stored hunger is like, don't you? Where you just, you know, you haven't been able to stabilize your blood sugar and meet your energy needs from early in the day, and it just gets into, into trouble. I like to see people eat five or 600 calorie breakfast. And I, you know why I said first meal of the day? Because people somehow think breakfast means seven o'clock in the morning. Well, if your first meal feels best to you at nine o'clock in the morning, then let that be your, you know, your first meal. But I will advise you, if you find yourself eating a big dinner and then somehow you want to graze through the evening, then you need to look to what's going on early in the day because I know why you aren't hungry in the morning because you wait late at night. But if you get in that cycle of little food through the day and big at night, then it's going to bite you on the backside every single day. Was there a question? Yeah, I was yeah. wondering if you could tell us a recommended breakfast, a sample of... Oh, I want to say what I eat. This is yeah. what I usually eat. I'll usually have like about a half... Oh, I'm not going to tell you amounts because it depends on your hunger. A big bowl of steel cut oats or, or rice green cereal, you know, brown rice cereal or multi-green cereal. And I'll pile that in a bowl. I'll put a bunch of fruit on it. I mean, I'm talking a whole apple and a few berries or, you know, a couple cups of berries, a lot. So that it's that 50-50 thing going on with the fruit. And then some walnuts or some flax seeds sprinkled on top. And i just totally satisfied with that. You know, you eat till your bills. Probably about five or 600 calories if I had to count just to give you a, a reference point. Okay? There's lots of variations, but that's my standard run. Um, pay attention to the process continuum. I, I call it the process continuum. When you go from a whole food, like a whole oat, to a, a cut up oat, as in steel cut oats, to oatmeal, to oat flour, to white flour. There's a continuum there. And if you're trying to look to eat until you're full without being fat, the more you are at the whole unprocessed end of the spectrum, the better off you are. Oftentimes for breakfast, I'll actually have a bowl of whole oats. Have you ever cooked that? Get the groats, cook them in your pressure cooker. It's absolutely delicious. Yeah. Put a bunch of, you know, chopped fruit in it. But that's even more whole. Um, preface with the perishables. It's really helpful when you're trying to eat this way of doing the, the, the kind of the 50-50 concept. Some people do even better with more of the vegetables. Uh, it can be interesting to look back on your day and see if you really did get enough vegetables. And I recommend you kind of take a look at that uh, because it may be that you're barely getting what you think it, you are getting in. But an easy way to sneak it in is before any of your other meals to have you know, a bowl of vegetables, a bowl of salad. That's why it's good to start with salad at lunch and dinner. And if that sounds like a big pain in the mm-hmm because you don't like to prepare a salad, you know what I do? I'm preparing lunch, I'm making soup and sandwiches, and I'll be chewing on a big carrot and a big chunk of cabbage. So by the time I get to the rest of the meal, that's a salad. Think that's like a salad bowl. It doesn't have to be chopped up in a bowl and labor intensive. It's just vegetables, right? I'll be prepared. You cannot eat what you don't have. If you say, I'm going to eat really well at the office today, then you get there and there's no food in the fridge and all there is is the vending machine, you have not supported yourself in your goal, right? Um, and I talked about level the playing field. You cannot eat according to hunger and fullness and expect to lose weight if you're eating a standard American diet because those three rules of society, okay? And uh, detect the dense. Where is it really, where are you hurting yourself? Um, if you find that, oh, well, like yesterday I had a, you know, a chunk of chocolate and, you know, so what? Well, what if the day before you had a chunk of chocolate? And then the day before that you had, you know, a slice of cake. And then they, these add up. We're not aware. We think they're just little things that really, you know, don't make a difference. 
But I'll tell you what, if someone were to tell me if I could never have a piece of chocolate or a glass of champagne at a wedding, just shoot me now. But I'm, so I'm saying those are fine and appropriate. But we eat as if it's a birthday party every day, you know? <laughs> Ice cream every night for dessert, so. And support yourself. Support yourself by being prepared with the right food, by staying connected, by coming to VegFest. This is big support for yourself. Keep connected with books that keep you educated and growing. Get yourself either a live or an online community. We do the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart every month. I'm one of the coaches there through BCRM. Uh, there's the Dr. McDougall forums, all kinds of resources for you. So there you have it. I hope that um, you have come away at those three rules to make a difference for you and that you can apply them. And I have, I have time for a couple more questions if you have, and I'll be outside signing books.